First of all, thank you very much for having me and thank you uh, to Andre and Alla and the rest of the team and all the volunteers for organizing this lovely conference and thank you all for uh, listening to me today. My name is Manuel Matusovic and I'm a freelance front-end developer from Vienna. This is uh, a part of Vienna. Everything looks like this in Vienna. Everything. I'm very happy to be here. This is my second time in Russia. Um, it's my first time in Moscow. I was in St. Petersburg last year for Peter CSS conference. It's an incredibly nice conference for front-end devs and designers. You should definitely check it out next year. This wasn't the only conference I attended last year. I was also at JSConf in Budapest in Hungary, and I saw multiple very interesting talks. But there was one talk that was especially thought-provoking uh, for me. And that was, yes, your site should and can be accessible by Laura Carav Carvajal, I guess. That's how it says. Uh, she explained how she and her team um, made accessibility a core part of their development process at the Financial Times, at FT.com. And she shared several lessons and advices. And those lessons were accessibility doesn't just happen. You have to make it happen. You have to do something. Train your people, so share articles and talks with your colleagues. Throw away your mouse, test your sites with a keyboard. So uh, throw away your mouse, yes, test your sites with a keyboard, and uh, don't take it all on yourself, so uh, get involved with other teams, with design and QA and so on. Talk about it, share what you've learned on Twitter or other social media, and um, make diversity a priority. So those were her six lessons, and all of them were very interesting and valuable. But there was one that especially caught my attention, and it was number three. It was throw away your mouse. Because Laura said that if you want to test keyboard accessibility, you have to go keyboard only. So not use the mouse at all. Don't touch it. Just use the keyboard for everything. And I was intrigued by the idea of going all in. So no mouse at all. And I wanted to do that. And during this talk, next to me was sitting Charlie Owen. And she wrote an article last year that was called A Day Without JavaScript. And she tried to use the web with JavaScript turned off. And this is how most sites look like. And she shared her, her um, experiences. So I thought that might be a great idea for a keyboard as well. So I wanted to use the web for a day only with the keyboard and share my ideas. But you know how it goes. I was too lazy, or maybe something else caught my attention. I just didn't do it. <laughs> Fast forward a few months, uh, this pops up in my feed. On Smashing Magazine, Chris Ashton wrote an article called I used the web for a day with just a keyboard. And I was like, ah, shit. That is exactly what I wanted to do, but uh, he did it. And he actually did pretty much the same thing I wanted to do. He went keyboard only, so it didn't touch his mouse. And he shared uh, all the experiences, the good and the bad parts, and a lot of code, and explained how things work. A great article. If you are new to keyboard accessibility, I suggest you read it. It's really great. But there's just one thing his post didn't answer for me. And it was this question. Would the web be usable and accessible to me personally if I wasn't able to use a mouse today? So if I couldn't use the mouse physically, would I be able to use the web? Of course, in order to answer that question, you need may, uh, way more time and way more data. So I continued my idea from last year. And this time, I decided to focus on data and on real life examples. So today, you are going to see a lot of numbers and a lot of real life code and real life demos. Like I said, I continued my idea and I threw away my mouse. No, I actually, I didn't throw it away because I'm a Mac user and Mac stuff is incredibly expensive. So I just put it away. But um, I didn't use it for quite a while, for two and a half weeks now. Before I share my findings and uh, the, the best practices and the bad practices, I want to talk about two things. The first thing is, I want to make sure that we all know why keyboard accessibility matters. First of all, it's important for people with physical disabilities, so people who cannot use a mouse. It's also important for people with chronic conditions, such as repetitive stress injuries, who should limit or avoid the use of mouse. But it's also important for, peop uh, for uh, people with temporary or situational impairments. For example, someone who would actually use a mouse but can't because he or she broke their arm. 
or um, in Hungary last year, I was talking to Katrina and she told me that she got a tattoo on her forearm and wasn't able to use a mouse because it hurt so much. So there are also temporary and situational impairments. And also screen reader users, so mainly blind people who use a screen reader, benefit from great keyboard accessibility. And people like you and me, we use the keyboard all the time in Photoshop and Illustrator and uh, VS Code, Sublime, and of course in Vim. So why not as well in the web? In general, if you make a site accessible, you get better, a better user experience for everyone. And this answers uh, the question uh, Alex asked earlier. So if you make the web better for a certain group of people, you make it better for everyone. So everyone benefits from it, kind of. The second thing I want to talk about is this nicely animated disclaimer here. I want, just want to make sure that you all understand that I did not perform any professional audits. I know how to make professional accessibility audits, but I did not. I only wanted to, to, to know if I am able to use the web with just a keyboard. So it's all just from my point of view as a user. So all, or not all, but some of the metrics and evaluations are simple and highly subjective because sometimes it's just my opinion of if it's usable or not. And I only tested pages and parts of pages, so not whole sites, only the stuff I was using. And of course, that's not representative for the whole web because I only did it in a very short period of time, only two and a half weeks, and it's only stuff I uh, use in the web. And I don't want to blame or shame any, anyone. It's about making the, be the web better, a better place and to help people make better websites and understand accessibility implications. Yes, I know this is a lot of uh, blah blah for a talk about uh, codes and demos, but there is just one thing I want to, to, to mention and then um, I'm going to show you just code. And it's the methodology. So how did I carry out the test and how did I document all the stuff I found out? I created a spreadsheet. I used, I don't know, LibreOffice or Excel, whatever. And I created 15 columns where I documented all the sites and all the um, things I wanted to test. Green means good, yellow means okay, red means bad, and uh, gray means neutral. It's there, it's not there, it doesn't matter. So uh, those 15 columns where the data visited the site, the name of the site, and the URL, you didn't see that because I said I don't want to blame or shame anyone, so I uh, grayed that out in the uh, previous screen. Then I wanted to test focus. Does, is focus styling present? Is it sufficient enough for me to, in order to use the site? Does the website has, have custom focus styling or does it rely on default focus styles? So th those were the things I wanted to test. The next thing I wanted to test is if skip links were present. Skip links are incredibly important for uh, keyboard and screen reader users, so I wanted to see how many sites have skip links. Who doesn't know what skip links are? No one? Zero? <laughs> okay. We have to talk about skip links a lot today. Uh, the next thing I wanted to know is how many websites use additional keyboard shortcuts? So how many websites implement custom shortcuts on their pages? The next thing I wanted to know, uh, I know that from, from earlier audits, from other audits, that hidden items that are visually not visible, so they're not in a viewport, but still tabbable, are a big issue. And I wanted to see on how many websites this issue is present. Then I wanted to know how many websites don't use HTML correctly. We all know that HTML is easy, like CSS, that's just uh, something everyone knows. Um, but let's see how many people don't get it right. <laughs> um, yeah, the next thing is bad focus management, especially on JavaScript heavy websites, it's important that focus moves around depending on where the user is uh, in the application. So I wanted to know um, on how many websites this might be an issue. Then, of course, order. I wanted to know on how many websites there is a mismatch between DOM order and visual order. And in general, I wanted to know is the site usable to me or not. Since I'm an accessibility guy and I'm a front end guy, I surf a lot on accessibility related and front end or web development related sites. So I also documented how many websites are accessibility related and web development related so I can compare them to normal sites to see if the numbers are different. I made the tests on two machines, on an iMac 27-inch. 
on macOS High Sierra and on a MacBook on macOS Sierra. So mostly desktop browsers because this is where I do the most browsing during work time. And I used Firefox and Chrome for testing. Most of the time, Firefox, because default styles, styles are um, not as clearly visible in Firefox as in Chrome, so it's uh, easier to get things wrong in Firefox. I only tested desktop, but mobile is also very important. Um, we shouldn't underestimate the importance of mobile keyboard users. According to the screen reader survey uh, conducted last year, 15.7% of screen reader users also use a keyboard with their mobile device always or often, and 25.7% of users use it sometimes. So there are mobile keyboard users. But I didn't test mobile, I only tested uh, desktop. Okay, finally, some results. I tested a total of 163 pages. I know this, is, this isn't a lot, but um, it's enough to get some uh, interesting data, I would say. And I will continue the test and I will share uh, the updated numbers in an article in December. So the first topic, focus. When I talk about focus, I talk about HTML elements that can receive focus by default if you use the tab or the shift tab key. So links, for example, or form elements like input and button, but also media elements like audio and video, area. Who, who does know, uh, know of the area element? Image maps, anyone? Okay. Uh, too many young people here. Um, and, I also, and also elements that by default aren't focusable, but can receive focus if they have certain attributes, like tab index or content editable. Of course, this, those 10 things here are just a subset of everything you could test. There is this very extensive table by the LEJS.io guys who tested um, different elements with, in combination with different attributes and if they're focusable or tabbable. It's a huge list and they tested it in, on different operating systems and browsers and so on. So if you're into that, check it out. So for example, here's a simple paragraph of two links and a form and if I press tab, you can see that the first item will, release, uh, will receive focus and the second and so on. So only links and form items but not the text itself or the label. This is how tab works and if I press shift tab, I can go the other way around, so uh, back. In this example, you can see some headings, some paragraphs and the links are focusable and the second heading, because it has the tab index attribute set to zero, and the second paragraph is also focusable because it has the content editable paragraph. The focus styling you see here, the, the red solid outline, isn't the default styles. This is something I did in CSS using the focus pseudo element. This is nothing new. It's been around since pretty much forever. I think uh, it goes up IE7 and up, so you can use it everywhere. You don't have to check, can I use? And it's pretty much like a hover. You just select it in their items in their focus state and gave them a special styling. On the other hand, what's pretty new is focus within. Who knows of focus within? Okay, a few people. That's something that's really exciting because uh, you can select an item not in its own focus state, but if it has children that are currently in focus. So if you look at this example, you will see that the, links, the link receives focus and the second link, and if one of the child items of the form is in focus, so the input field or the button, the form will show this yellow border. So that's what focus within does. Support is quite all right. You can use it in most desktop browsers, uh, major desktop browsers. Um, and I would say you can use it today if you're not using it for anything too critical. Now, one thing that's annoying about focus styling is that sometimes you don't want it in certain situations. For example, you don't want to see focus styling uh, when you're using the mouse. That sometimes that can be uh, annoying and confusing. And this is where focus visible comes into play. And this is how, it, how you, would, you would use it. Uh, you would select an item, for example, a button, a button in its focus state, and if apply some default focus styling, and then you would select it again in its focus state, but you would make sure that it's not in a focus visible state. So by using this selector, you're only targeting mouse users and not keyboard users. And 
because this focus visible pseudo class only applies to keyboard users. And it's not up to us to decide if it applies or not. The browser does, it f does this for us, so that's pretty cool. And then you can select all keyboard users and enhance styling and add some extra stuff that will make items in their focus st state extra visible. Support, yeah, pretty much non-existent. N none of the browser supports it. Uh, you can use it in Chrome behind the flag, or you can use the, the practiced focus ring property in Firefox, but there is a very, very lightweight um, polyfill. And I'm using it all on my projects. It works pretty great. The only difference is that instead of using a focus visible pseudo class, you just use a focus visible class that gets applied uh, with JavaScript. OK, 72.39% mm, of web pages use default styles, according to my tests. I wouldn't attach too much significance to that number. It just says, OK, 70% of sites have somewhere in their design foc default focus styling. The, yeah. But 15.34 sites have no styles at all. And the pessimist in me thought this number is going to be much, much higher. But as it turns out, only 15% of sites have no styles at all. Now, we have to put this number into perspective because um, other sites have focus styles, but on most sites, focus styles are pretty bad. And I'm going to show the numbers uh, later. Just so that we all understand what no focus styles means, um, this is the fo form from, from before. And I've res uh, removed all the focus styles, and this is how it looks like. You can see that I'm pressing the tab key, and it's there is no way of telling where we are in this document. The only thing you can see from time to time is the uh, cursor popping up in one of the input fields, but that's pretty much it. So this little component here isn't usable at all. And if you want bad accessibility, it's easy. You just need three lines of CSS. You select all items in their focus state and set outline to none, and that's it. And uh, you've included a huge group of people from being able to use your site. Please don't do it. Uh, this is so bad, it even has a, 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 a own site dedicated to this problem. It's called outline none.com, and it says, don't do it, because it's really bad. Um, yes, if you don't want, for whatever reason, to apply any default focus styling, it's OK. Just don't, uh, custom focus styling, just don't remove default styles. If you take the form from before without my custom styling, but with default styles in Chrome, this is what it looks like. It's possible to see where we are in the document. It's not as good as my custom styling, but it's all right. And 36.2% of websites use default styles and no custom styles. Like I said, it's better than nothing, but it is kind of a problem. First of all, because Focus styling is very different across browsers and operating systems. So for example, in Chrome, you will see this blurry blue outline. Uh, in Firefox, you will see a gray dotted outline. And on Android, for example, a solid orange one. So it's very, very different. And sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. In the, our previous example, the blue outline in Chrome worked great on the dark background. But for example, here, it doesn't work at all. I don't know if you see it, but there is focus styling on the second link. It doesn't work that well because the contrast, contrast ratio is very low. So it just makes sense to apply custom styling because you know which colors you are using in your corporate design. Now, um, almost 50% of pages have at least some kind of focus styling. So that number is pretty high. That's good. Half of the pages use custom focus styling. But the fact alone that custom focus styles are present doesn't mean that they are good. For example, here, you can see the, word, the first word, fundamentals, is currently in its active and hover state. Here you can see the blue outline, or the blue line. And the word updates is in its focus style. The only difference between tools and updates is that updates has a darker gray. And it's very hard to see, or at least it was for me. Fortunately, the screen is pretty good, so you see, can see it. But uh, on most screens, you, you won't be able to see the difference between tools and updates. OK, now those numbers are highly subjective. It's just my personal judgment, my personal opinion. Of all the sites tested, 
41% had bad focus starts. So I wasn't either able to use the site at all, or I would get lost while doing that. So yeah, that's, that's bad. 40% have okay focus style, so I was able to use the site, but uh, it wasn't that easy. I would get lost from time to time, but I was, I was able to perform the task I wanted to do. And only 18% have really good focus styles. Now, let me give you some examples. Uh, this is Scott O'Hara's personal blog, and you can see if I tap through this page, it's clearly visible where in the navigation I am, and if I focus Links, for example, uh, it's clearly visible which link is currently being focused. And he uses different CSS classes to apply it focus styling. For example, the details element gets an outline and links get a background color. So that's pretty nice. Another nice example is Eurowings. That's an airline. And I was booking my trip to Barcelona in October. And um, I saw that focus styles on their website work pretty well. They're even using JavaScript to make the transition from one item to the next one. And they are using their corporate design colors uh, pretty well, if you ask me. So you can see the, this, this pink color, whatever it is. Uh, they're using it for the focus style. And it's clearly visible and easy to use. OK, now let's talk about something completely new about skip links. Uh, only 20% of pages provide skip links. So no wonder I expected actually to see 20% of people here raising their hands. But zero is something else. But OK, let's see what skip links are. Um, let's take a look at this website. If I'm using the tab key, you can see that I have to tap to the logo, to those links, to the burger icon, to this local navigation, and then I get to the content. Or Instead of doing that, I could just use this link and jump directly to the content. So skip links are links that are usually at the very beginning of the DOM, and they're hidden. And they're only visible in focus. And when they're shown focus, you can click them to directly jump to certain parts in the page. For example, the content here. I'm going to show you some more examples. Now, hiding those links isn't that easy. You need a few properties. I mean, you could do it with less, but there are some complications. You can't just use transform or position, for example, because uh, those hidden elements might interfere with other visible elements. And you can't just use display none, because if you use display none, it's inaccessible to, key, uh, to screen reader users. So you need a combination of links to uh, get it working. Here's another example on MDN. You can jump to the content, to the navigation, to the footer, but you can also jump to the language selection directly without having to go to, through all the links in the header, which makes a lot of sense in their case because they have content in many different languages. So without having to tap through the header, I can directly jump to the footer where I can switch the language to Russian and then use the site from there. So this is uh, pretty cool. Not just for keyboard users or screen reader users, but pretty much for everyone who likes to use the keyboard. Another example is the Financial Times. They have a few skip links to the navigation, to the content, to the footer, and a, a specific link to an accessibility help page where they explain how they um, work with accessibility, how, uh, what the limitations are of the website, and how you can get in touch with them. So that's pretty nice that, you can, that they uh, publicly share how they implement accessibility on their website. Another example is Facebook. I've replaced the images and the content because I don't have Facebook and I had to use my girlfriend's uh, profile and I didn't want to show her photos. Um, if you use the tab key, you can see that another navbar is popping up. And this is pretty cool because you can navigate through this list and they will highlight the areas you can jump to. So you can see an outline while you browse through this list of items. And if you click it, you can directly jump into this part of the page. So that's uh, pretty nice. Pretty a uh, great way of uh, working with skip links. Like I said, most skip links are at the very beginning of a page. So usually they're the first item on a page. But sometimes it makes sense to implement in-page skip links. For example, on this side, you can see in the sidebar, there is a Twitter widget. And there are a lot of tweets in there and a lot of focusable elements. So if I would use the tab key, I don't know if you see it, but now in this, I'm in this widget, and I would have to go a num through a number of tweets to get to uh, the footer. And this is why they provide a skip Twitter feed skip link right before this tweet. So I don't have to go through all the links in this widget. I can just skip it and jump to the next focusable item. 
So that's also pretty nice. On this website, I wish that they had skip links. Let me show you why. So if I want to get to the content, I have to go through the navigation on top, through social media links, through the main navigation, and then through this list of links, and then I wait a little bit. <laughs> and finally, I'm on the page. And I have to do this for every single page I'm on. So you can see that skip links are really, really important, and they're easy to implement. You just throw in some links, you hide them, you just copy and paste the slide I just so showed you, and that's it. Uh, and you have uh, skip links, so that's pretty cool. And very important for keyboard and screen reader users. The next topic I want to talk about are keyboard shortcuts. I found nine websites out of the 163 uh, that use custom keyboard shortcuts. The first one is Twitter. If I want to compose a new tweet on Twitter, I just press N. And then I can write. I can close that by pressing Escape. I can switch to my notifications by pressing GN. I can go back to the home page by pressing GH. I can browse tweets by pressing J and K. And if I want to like, I just press L. And I can completely use Twitter by using just the keyboard. That's pretty cool. And since I found out that you can do this, I'm just using this. I'm not using the mouse anymore. Uh, because you can get really fast by using the keyboard. If you press the question mark on Twitter, you will see a cheat sheet with all the shortcuts they have. That's, that's pretty cool. If you want to waste your time more efficiently, you can use keyboard shortcuts on Reddit as well. For example, if you press Q, you get to the navigation. If you press J and K, you can browse uh, posts. And if you are logged in, I'm definitely not going to show a video where I'm logged in on Reddit. Uh, but if you're logged in, there are shortcuts for um, uploading and downloading, for composing comments and new posts and so on. So they also have uh, a few shortcuts. And if you press the question mark key or shift question mark, you can also view the cheat sheet. Another side is GitHub, and they have a lot. If you press GN, you can jump to the notifications. If you press GD, you get back to the dashboard. If you press S, you can jump directly to the search. And they have some site-wide shortcuts and some sp page-specific shortcuts. And they have a lot of shortcuts. This list is scrollable. It's like uh, three times of what you see now is uh, available to you on GitHub um, if you want to use shortcuts. Another, great web another website that works great with the keyboard is Google Maps. If you tap into Maps, this blue rectangle will show up. You can move it by using the arrow keys. And if you get to a certain area where there are pins, each pin will get a number, for example, 1. And if I press 1, it will lo load the detailed information of that place. So keyboard also works great on Google Maps, not just on uh, typical websites. Another website with keyboard shortcuts is Facebook as well. If you press Tab, um, you will see the skip links I just showed you before, but there's also a dedicated link to keyboard shortcuts where you can list all the shortcuts you can use on Facebook. That's pretty cool. But there are some accessibility concerns with single key shortcuts. So if you're using a modifier with your keys, for example, Shift or Control, it's fine. But if you're using single keys, it might be problematic for people who, who um, use speech control. Because let's say if the letter K is scrolling the page and someone says, says cake, it might happen that this command is going to be fired because the letter K is in the word. So what you should make sure is that you have a mechanism of turning shortcuts off. You can see that on Gmail. Gmail has a lot of shortcuts, but in the settings, you can switch them off. Or you should prov uh, provide a mechanism of remapping shortcuts to other keys. For example, I don't know if I have sound. Let's try. This user is on Twitter. James. And he's saying James. And this is what happens. The, the page will scroll, J. It will open the message dialog, M. And it will type the letters E and S. Because James. Because he's using speech control. And all those events get fired at once. And that's not good. So uh, provide a mechanism of turning that off for some users if they don't want it. James. But it's great for uh, power users. The next thing I checked is if there are hidden items present. So items that are not in the viewport but still focusable. And that was the case on 17.79 uh, 
uh, pages. To give you an, an idea of what I mean, here is a button, and I can press this button to show the navigation, the main navigation, like in a typical flyout um, menu. And I can also use the keyboard. I will tap to the button, I press Enter, and I can select all those items. If I don't open the button, I can still select those items. They're still present for keyboard users. This is because I've just used Transform Translate X to move the navigation away. It's not visible, but still focusable. That's not cool. And also, just setting the height to zero on the parent container doesn't work either. It's still accessible to keyboard users, even though they don't want it to be accessible. They need a control, like we have the control with the mouse. So if you want to properly hide stuff, you want to use the hidden attribute in HTML, maybe. That's the equivalent to display none in CSS. Or you can just use CSS, display none. Or you can set tab index to minus one on those focusable items and only uh, change this value when the navigation is visible to zero, for example. Another issue I stumbled upon is, um, for example, huge navigations with sublists. For example, if you have a, well, one of the links here in the navigation, for example, products, a, a sub menu list will show up. And on many sites, this only happens on hover, but not on focus. So for keyboard users, on some sites, only the main navigation items are usable, and the rest isn't. WordPress does a great job. So if you use the keyboard here, you can see that the sub-navigation items show even on focus. So that's a good thing. Let's talk about some easy stuff. Or at least I thought it's easy, or some people say it's easy. 28.83% 28 of, uh, 28 of sites uh, had some issues with their HTML. I have to say I didn't validate whole pages. I just looked under the hood if I got suspicious for some reason. For example, if I tried to focus a button, but it wasn't focusable. I wanted to find out why. So if I did proper validations, this number would be much higher, I guess. Let's take a look at this. Um, I found this pattern. It's a real, from a real website, and I found it on many websites. Many sites are using a link, an anchor element, without the href attribute. But if it hasn't an href attribute, it's not a proper link. You can't apply focus styling. You can't focus it. It's not accessible to screen reader users as a link. And you can't use uh, uh, keyboard shortcuts like enter on those links. And you can see here that they're using tab index on the list item to make it focusable. This is easily fixable by just removing tab index and adding this href attribute. You can still put your JavaScript on top of that and uh, prevent default uh, actions. And now this is completely accessible to everyone. This one's also very common. This is a button to open a mo modal dialog, but it's not a real button, it's a span element. And the problem with that is that it's not focusable. You have no events attached to it, no key events. Of course, you, if you add a click event, you can click it, but there are no um, keyboard events, and you can't apply focus styles, and yes. It's just the wrong HTML element. If you need a button, just use the button element, because you can focus it, and if you press space or enter, it will fire the click event. The next example actually looks quite all right. You have a search form and a button. Nothing too special, but the way they style this button is this. They have a button element, but they set the display to none, and then, for whatever reason, they're using uh, a CSS pseudo element to add a fake button. But the problem here is this button isn't focusable. It doesn't convey, convey any kind of state. It doesn't convey uh, their role to screen reader users, and you can't click it because it's a pseudo element. Of course, you can attach a uh, click event to the whole input or form, but it wasn't the case here. And I don't understand why, because uh, you can style buttons easily. So what you have to do here is get rid of the display none and just select the button and not uh, edit via a pseudo element. Pretty basic stuff, actually, but it happens uh, quite often. So I guess it's up to us who build uh, websites to maybe revisit some of the basic stuff, HTML and CSS, and um, just you know, not try to, 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 to learn the next uh, JavaScript framework or like next CSS, CSS framework, uh, framework, but also discover some of the older stuff. OK. Um, focus is managed badly on almost 20% of pages. 
And when I talk about focus management, this is what I mean. Let's say we have one of those buttons. This is a real button, a button button. And if I focus it and I press enter, you can see this modal dialog, dialog popping up. And if I keep tabbing, you can see that focus is behind the modal. I have to go through all links in the page until I finally reach it. What I would expect is that if I press this button, that focus will jump into the modal window. So this is what you want. If you focus the button, you want to shift focus using the focus method in JavaScript. And if you close the modal, focus should jump back to the button where it came from. And this happens on quite a few sites. Another issue I found is that some flyout navigations aren't accessible to keyboard users. For example, here on YouTube, you can see there is a burger icon uh, in the left corner. And if I press, focus it and press Enter, and I keep tabbing, I'm in the header, and then I'm in the list of videos, and there is no way of me getting to this uh, navigation that just opened. And even if I go through all videos, it's not possible because uh, if I'm at the bottom, YouTube will just load more videos and more videos and more videos. So there's no way of uh, me getting to that navigation. Completely inaccessible, unfortunately. OK, the last technical thing I checked is order. And there was an order mismatch, so a mismatch between DOM order and visual order only on 8.59% of web pages. I thought that this number is going to be much, much, much higher. But it wasn't. There were some sites where visual order didn't match DOM order, but it wasn't that big of a problem because if focus styles are good enough, it's OK if some things aren't in right order. Here's an example, uh, Austrian newspaper. I can tap through the navigation, and then it will jump to the social, no, to the lower navigation, then to this on the right. And it's not in the correct order, but if you can clearly see where you are in the page, it's OK. It wasn't on that page, so the pink uh, border is mine. It's not theirs. So yeah, it wasn't all right on this page, but if it is, it's OK. So the number is really low, but I think it's going to increase, because before Flexbox, we only had properties like margin and floats to change order. And then with Flexbox, we got order and flex direction. And now with grid, we have even more power to change order. We have grid column, grid row, grid template, uh, grid template areas, grid auto flow. So much more power, and it's easier to change order. So I guess this number is going to increase. The most interesting part about order was that I didn't, the most issues didn't happen because of bad CSS, but of bad HTML, actually. I'm here on stat counter, for example, and if I press tab, you can see that the first thing in order are the social media icons there. And then I only get to the navigation. And the reason for that is that they're using tab index and a higher tab index value than zero. So this is a third party widget. And on every par page this widget is in, the social media icons are going to be the first thing in focus. And I don't think that you need the social media icons on every page uh, as the first thing in focus. So it is, it, is, it is really a bad practice to use higher values than zero in tab index. So please don't do it. To prove my point, here is one of the worst examples. Um, I changed the colors, I changed the images, I changed the text, so I don't, because I don't want to uh, shame anyone, but this is really, really bad. Uh, focus is on the first item, and if I press tab, I expect it to jump to the next link. This is what happens. It jumps to the footer, to a second footer animation, uh, uh, navigation, then back, and this happens for the whole site. And then, finally, I get to the header. And then I have to go through all sublinks. They're not visible. Um, and then I get to the content. So it will take me about a minute or more uh, to get to the content on this page. So really, please don't use tab index higher than zero. Now, the main question. Uh, for me, only 58.2 sites were usable of all sites. So uh, only a little bit more than half. If we look at just web development related sites, it, the number is a little higher, but still pretty low. It's 64%. Uh, and luckily, 100% of accessibility related sites were completely keyboard usable. So that's a good thing. Um, so let's see. Let's answer my question. Would the web be usable and accessible to me if I wasn't able to use a mouse today? No, not really, because I just found myself way too often looking at a status bar to find out where I am. I had to open DevTools constantly to remove those outline nuns and zeros. Uh, it's just, no. 
But it's important, it's really important. So if you want to get it right, the first thing you can do, provide clearly visible focus tiles. If you're too lazy, just do this. Just double up your hover uh, declarations. Just add focus. It's better than nothing. And that's easy. Just, it's just one more line. You can even write a sus mix in or less or whatever. <laughs> and uh, this will do it for you. Learn semantic HTML and use it properly. And I don't mean this in a, in a bad way. Just, just learn that stuff. We have to learn like everything else. We have to, we have to learn it like CSS and, and JavaScript. And even though it's easy to get into HTML, there is a lot to get right and wrong. So we have to, to, to work a, a lot with, um, on our HTML on it, knowledge. If you're not sure when to use a link or a button, I can highly suggest this talk by Marcy Sutton. It's called uh, The Links versus Buttons Showdown. It's a great... Uh, uh, talk. It's uh, avail available on YouTube. Watch it. It's awesome. Implement skip links. Now that you know what skip links are, uh, do it. I even have a code pen for you. It's online and I've commented all the, the lines I'm using here just so you understand why uh, I'm using it. And yes, you can copy and paste it and use it in your next site. Avoid tab ind indices higher than zero. It's a bad practice. There's an article by Adrian Roselli where he explains it why and he has some more examples. Just don't do it. Please don't do it. And finally, test your sites with the keyboard. And don't test it just on one screen size, but on uh, all screen sizes or multiple screen sizes. I recently stumbled upon this great Chrome extension. It's called Chrome Lens, and it has a tab tracker. So if you tap through a page, it will track where you are. And you can download this as a PNG and show it to your designers or developers or whatever and show them um, what's wrong about tab order. That's pretty cool. And if you want to learn more about uh, keyboard accessibility in general, you can check out the WAI website, the Web Accessibility Initiative, where they explain why keyboard uh, accessibility is important and what you have to do. And that's it. It's possible. <laughs> that was really fast at the end. I'm sorry. Yeah, and uh, it is good actually, so we have uh, okay, more thanks. time for questions. And uh, questions, please. Uh, hello, thank you uh, for the presentation. Welcome. Um, actually, uh, it, it was very, very interesting for me because in uh, my project, our customers, uh, their requirements are to uh, support keyboard and, um, oh, cool. uh, shortcuts. And um, our um, users uh, for this application, they don't use mouse at all. So we uh, had uh, to implement uh, full uh, keyboard uh, support. And um, the main um, point um, that um, I had from mm -hmm. this, um, it, it was a very interesting. Um, we had to implement uh, services uh, for um, different uh, shortcut commands um, and uh, to pass the different uh, types of actions. Uh, but uh, I faced one problem in pr browser. Um, control N, Control Shift N, Control W. Uh, they uh, couldn't be overridden. Oh, okay. Yes, and uh, it, it was pain, um, but um, we um, use our app in Electron, so um, Electron supports it, uh, but uh, Chrome and uh, Firefox and all other browsers, they um, disallow uh, this uh, on browser level uh, b because of... Uh, um, violence um, mm -hmm. from other sites okay. like this. So I wanted to share my experience uh, that uh, con cool. uh, this, uh, some um, key combinations uh, couldn't be overridden. Cool. What, what kind of application was it? Uh, web application um, for, for uh, medical, uh, mm -hmm. to create some um, Okay, so in they were using it on machines where they had no mouse, so they, they had, had to be yes. completely... Okay, uh, interesting, cool. Yes. They awesome. They have no mouses. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, next question, please. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, can you mention some techniques how we can uh, 
manage our focus, uh, especially for the model window. Uh, I mean, how we can implement it to focus capturing when when you when you open the window to let it be in the window. I mean, model window. Um, well, there are two ways that I can think of spontaneously. The first one is there is this uh, autofocus uh, attribute in HTML. So if you want it to be in a form, for example, in the model window, you can just add the autofocus attribute to this form. Um, or the JavaScript focus method, just focus. Uh, what about uh, to put it back when the model window is closed? Uh, usually, uh, I guess, user expect uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. to put it back. Um, the way I did it in the example I just showed is that when I click the button, I will save the currently focused element. So it's a document dot active element, and you get with using that you get the uh, last focus element, and I just store it in a variable. And when uh, the user closes the model window, I use this to focus back. So it's a document dot document element. Yeah, and the modern frameworks like React, Angular, Vue are amazing for this. By the way, uh, after questions and answers section, uh, we need to gift one book. So please uh, remember which uh, of the questions uh, do you like the most. Uh, next question, please. Thank you for the presentation and uh, all of your examples were about the desktop websites. And what about the mobile ones? Because nowadays most of the users use mobile phones or tablets and they also can connect the keyboard uh, through USB or use the virtual one. And also is how is it important to show users uh, the areas that are focused in the forum and so on. I would say that uh, this is um, material for another talk because, like I said, I just tested uh, desktop sites because I did this during working hours and also need to get some work done. So <laughs> it would be pretty hard to test like everything. But um, you're right. Uh, I should probably do another test with just mobile sites because, like you said, they're very important. And I assume, I'm not sure, but I assume that uh, the numbers are worse on mobile because uh, most of us, at least to some point, use a keyboard and, uh, on desktop, but on mobile we just don't care about keyboard, because I, or at least some of us don't do, because um, it's easy to forget keyboard users on Touch mobile. screen. Hmm? Touch screen on yeah. mobile. Yeah, because it's very handy. But you're right, it's, it's very important. Thank you. Next thank question, you. please. Uh, uh, thank, thank you for your talk. Uh, there is a question, um, is there any tools or techniques to automate testing if site is accessible with keyboard or it is only manual? Um, uh, not that I know because it's uh, using the keyboard and testing components is a very manual task so there, there aren't, I don't think that there aren't many, many metrics to measure um, measure that kind of stuff. Of course, uh, there are tools that will check if, uh, for example, contrast ratios are high enough, so that, that could be something that, that might, might work, that it tests if the, the contrast ratio of the focus styling is good enough. But all the other stuff is just, most of the time it's custom JavaScript that we write, so non-standardized stuff. And I don't believe that there are tools. You can write them yourself, maybe, uh, tests, but uh, not that I know of. Okay, thank yeah. you. And I would also uh, recommend to not automate that, but to test it by yourself, because by um, making sites keyboard accessible, you learn so much about all the things you didn't get right. Because uh, if you see there is a button and you press the keyboard and you see, hey, th this button is not uh, focusable, you probably didn't use the right element. So you learn a lot about the things, uh, the mistakes, the little mistakes you might have uh, made in your code. So it's a good thing to improve uh, accessibility and code quality in general on your site. Yeah, yeah, it's okay if you do your own site, but if it's a big production uh, site and mm -hmm. do it manual every time, it, it's kind of expensive. That's true, that's true. Um, I know that there are automated accessibility tests like uh, Pelly, for example, that will check against uh, s some rules, but I don't know if it also checks keyboard, but I will check. And if I find something Thank out, you. I will share it on Twitter or, or Thank you. Uh, with the organizers. Thank you, Manuel, for your talk. It was That's really interesting. Where, where, where? Ah. 
Sorry. It was really interesting. And my question is, uh, what is the most uh, annoying problem which you, uh, which you found during your research and uh, what people handle with? Um, focus styles, definitely. Like missing focus styles or really bad focus styles because this is a showstopper. If, if there's no focus styles, I'm not able to use it at all. I can, you can just throw away the side, it, it's not usable. Uh, th this and uh, skip links, definitely. You, you just saw the, the, the example with the uh, numerous links. Th that is really annoying because you have to go through all the links until you reach the content. Uh, so I would say those were the two most annoying uh, things. Focus styles. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, if you try any credit card timing, uh, uh, service, uh, it will be like focus on credit card number, then name, then you expect uh, date, uh, but it will go through all the button on website and return to date that yes. you will uh, miss uh, for sure. Because they're probably also using tab index, I guess. Yes, yeah. mm. yes, yes. Please. You all really want the book? There are many questions. <laughs> uh, thank you for uh, your presentation. Thank uh, you. It was really cool because we also um, focus at this time every day. I'm from bank uh, systems, and mm -hmm. um, our every day is also payment systems. Um, uh, we need to. Microphonic uh, We need to uh, put uh, uh, people to uh, pen uh, down to a uh, year, uh, month, uh, CVC. Yep. And my question is: uh, Will we need to uh, make it out of focus to next uh, input uh, if uh, he fill it correctly? And uh, will it be a, a good pattern or bad? Uh, that uh, I would say that depends on the implementation because from a user perspective, some of them are really shitty. Like you type and then all of a sudden uh, you type in a different fields and then some numbers are missing and sometimes it works really great. So I would say that is um, a pattern where you can get a lot of things wrong and this is where you need manual testing. You need users to test it and to see if they are able to use it and uh, decide it for yourself. I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't give a general answer to that because uh, it highly depends on your users and if they and how you implemented it. So uh, th that's something I would test a lot. Okay, uh, may, may I ask yes. you? Uh, unfortunately, time is up. You will be able to ask questions on our coffee oh. uh, area and we will have lunch time next. So please, one more round of applause. Thank you. And um, social question, who will receive this uh, amazing <laughs> book? So who did I like the most? <laughs> no, um, I'm going to give it for you because you shared your personal experience. Uh, I really liked that. But all Please, were great. more applause. And uh, for you, small tokens of our uh, gratitude, uh, this um, Tumblr with uh, conference uh, name for your um, uh, winters to keep uh, something warm. And... Uh, uh, a That's small uh, poster. Thank, Thank you. you.